church say amen. Uh, David said it like this, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And that's certainly what we, what we exhibited, even though the car was, uh, was completely totaled out. Uh, my wife made a uh, joke with me as I looked at it because she called me uh, to come get them. And the police were there. And I looked at it. I said, well, I think they can fix it. And, uh, and she just, after, after everything happened, she kept telling me it was just so funny to her because I actually thought that they could put Humpty back together again. <laughs> but it's obvious, it's obvious that it was just too much work. But that's not really the, the most important thing at all. What's most important is that uh, my wife and SJ are doing well. Amen. amen. And God provided. Can the church say amen? Metal and plastic can be replaced. But a human life is precious. Can the church say amen? And so we, I guess we'll have an inside joke for the rest of our lives that the car could not be repaired. Can the church say amen? There was all type of fluids on the ground and all of these things. But in any case, we thank God for his goodness. And I certainly thank God for looking out for all of the saints also. Praise the Lord. Uh, and it is true that we have to be especially careful now especially when the snow begins to fly. And I, sometimes I, I get a little befuddled where people who live in Michigan, when the snow comes, they, they forget where they, where they live at. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And they just, I see these trucks, and I drive, a, I drive an SUV, and I'm like, I'm going to slow down. But you see these trucks, it's because they got four-wheel drive. They'll just run right, they'll go 70 miles an hour down the highway, and snow is everywhere, and the next thing you know, I'm honking my horn at them as they're in the ditch. Now, I'm not actually doing that, but in any case, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just making light a little bit. But I did have to go to Jackson in that, in that storm that, was, uh, that came, uh, I think it was last Friday night, and uh, you saw the cars in the ditch and all of those type of things, and it just helps us understand that we need to slow down and we need to make sure uh, we understand where we stay at. And um, certainly to let the Lord take care of us. Can the church say amen? amen. All right, we want to get into the word of the Lord tonight. Um, we want to talk about, as we've uh, been dealing with the uh, title of the church organized body, or in essence, church government. And as we, have all, as we said before, and we'll say again, the government is a, is a way of life for us all. Government is in every single facet of life, whether it be in the school system, uh, whether it be in um, um, whether it be in civil government, whether it be in the halls of justice, wherever you want to, whatever you want to call, uh, government is a way of life. And whether people understand it or not, God is actually the author of government. He established government in the very basic, fund uh, fundamental places of life, and that's the family. Can the church say Amen? And government is simply, simply. Um, how can I say it, a way for one's life to be governed according to some type of rule. Can the church say amen? Now, if we look at the family, uh, for, an exa for an example, when God made Adam, um, he said government. Now, how did he set government? He made Adam the head over everything uh, that pertained to um, creation as it pertains to, of course, this world. Can the church say Amen. He took all of those animals and brought them before Adam and gave him dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the beast of the field. That's government. And then when Adam could not find any um, creature that was like unto himself, God put Adam to sleep, which actually was a type, um, I don't have time to show you this, a type of what God did even in the church. And then he brought the, he brought the church, or excuse me, he brought the woman out of of out of Adam, same way that he brought the church as it were out of himself. Can the church say amen? Jesus went to sleep in the grave for three days and three nights, came up out of the grave, and thus the church was birthed. Can the church say amen? And we are, as it were, I'm speaking, uh, how can I say, uh, in generalities here now, that we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Now, that's what, uh, that's what um, Eve was. Can the church say amen? And now the church is, how can I say it? We are the ones, sister, God is birthing children out of. Just like 
God birthed the children out of Eve, and she was the mother of what? All living, because she has a womb. Somebody say, man cannot reproduce children, praise the Lord, out of his womb, because he doesn't have one. But thanks be to God for the womb of a mother. And when I go into the, when I went into the um, operating room and saw my children born, I began to shout and speak in tongues and say hallelujah. I didn't say, I'm just kidding. But I was, I was happy that I'm a man. And I don't, have to, I don't have to endure that grief. Can the church say hallelujah? No, I didn't, I didn't literally start shouting. But, I, but it is, I thank God that God made me a man. Can the church say amen? And, and thank God that hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Because that is something I don't want to have to endure. And quite frankly, I don't think any man could deal with it, to be honest with you. So kudos to you sisters. God bless you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But in any case, this is what God did. So government, and then when he established his saints, he established what is called rule. Can the church say amen? He established a way of life. And as I've said before, where there is no government, there's anarchy. That is a principle that works not only in civil society, it also works in the government or the system of rule that God has established in the church. Now, God gives us the right to set up uh, from, a, from, a, from the standpoint of the church as to how we do things, but he does not allow us to deviate from the scriptures when we do it. We have a right to set up the government in our local churches. Praise the Lord. But he gives us a blueprint as to how we're supposed to do it. He gives us a road map. And if the church is going to function properly, then everything within the church has to have the basic imprints of the road map. Can the church say amen? I'll give you an example where things can become anarchy if you do not have a system of rule that, is, that is, um, operates properly. Have you heard the term in Christendom such as co pastor you ever heard of that? Well, there is no such thing in the Bible. Can the church say amen? Because as one man said, anything that has two heads is a monstrosity or a freak. You ever watch those um, old movies um, where they had the two-headed monster? Cut the, ta just cut, cut the TV off because I don't want you to have any bad dreams. But to simply to make the point, that's not normal. Isn't that right? So what we have to understand is that some of these terms and some of these ways of governing that people are using um, and bringing them and trying to adopt them as a part of what we're supposed to do will actually cause more harm than good. Can the church say amen? There can only be one head of the church, and of course that's Jesus. But then God, gives a, um, a, God puts a head over every local church, namely the New Testament pastor. And then he has the responsibility to set up the government within the church according to the scripture. Can the church say amen? And if he does it properly, then the, then the, the people and or the church will operate in harmony, in togetherness, in unity, in oneness, so that God can be what? Glorified. Now, in the Old Testament, there are types and shadows as to how this is done. And we showed you some of these things in this particular Bible class of how the church court was set up. Praise the Lord, the type of the New Testament pastor. Can the church say hallelujah? The helps that God puts in the church, such as the board of deacons or the ruling board of elders and why they're there. Hallelujah. And, and the reason why God did all these things is so the church can be organized. The church should not be dysfunctional. It should not be dis in disarray. So we set up, for example, when we have an order of service, we, have, we start at 7, correct? So the, t so the, the song um, leader is supposed to be there singing, right? Then you have the prayer. Then you have the testimony or whatever the case may be, the Bible class, whatever the case may be. All of that, to a certain degree, is in your Bible. Can the church say amen? Everything is done in a specific time, in a specific order, according to the scripture. And I can show you that in the, in the Old Testament also. They were supposed to make sure the candles were lit in the, um, in the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the temple, praise the Lord, 
in the, um, what was it, the sanctuary at the right time. Praise the Lord. They had to offer an evening and a morning sacrifice at the right time. And if it was not done at the right time, then God would, would not be um, happy and the children of Israel would suffer loss. Isn't that right? They couldn't come and say, well, hold on, you know, I was a little late with bringing my sacrifice. Hold on, I got some things to do. No, it had to be there when it was supposed to be there. Can the church say amen? The priest can say, well, you know, I'm running behind today, so I'm not going to be able to make it to church. Hallelujah. Are you with me? All of these things are in the Bible for, for a reason. But that's not what we're going to deal with tonight. Let's go now to Isaiah. And we were dealing with the church court. And this is where we left off, I think it was the week before last, or last week, if memory serves me correct. So I want to give you this scripture before we go into our New Testament example of the procedure that we follow in the church court. Let's go now to Isaiah chapter number um, 28. Now this is a prophecy concerning the church. This is Sister Seawood, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y, as you ask that question. This is what this is pertaining to. Isaiah chapter 26, verses 5, I mean 28, verses 5 and 6. Praise the Lord. Get a little comfortable here. And I'm going to try to run through this as fast as possible because I would really want to wrap this Bible, Bible class up. We've been on this for some time. This is dealing with our day. No, oh, let me get there. I keep telling you to, to, hurt, to move fast, and now I'm slow. Okay, let's read here verses number five. Read. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of, of his people. Now, this is what he desired to do in the first case for Israel. Praise the Lord. The scripture said in St. John chapter number 1, I think around verses numbers 12, he came unto his own, his own received them not. His own was Israel. They were supposed to receive him as a diadem of beauty. Praise the Lord. As, as it were a crown of glory. Praise the Lord. But they didn't because of unbelief. But now that diadem of beauty is now shining in our church through those who have been born again of water and of spirit. Are you with me? In that day refers to our day. Whenever you, hear, you, whenever you hear, the, hear the term that day, you have to determine what day he's talking about. And the way we know it, it is our day because if you drop down to verses numbers, uh, let me see here, um, 9 through approximately 11, it speaks about how the Holy Ghost is going to come. Those that will receive it, praise the Lord, are those that will be drawn from the milk, weaned from the breast, something along those lines. I'm, not, I'm just not, not saying it exactly. So this is pertaining to our day. Because in the New Testament church, Brother Follett, we, we come into the church as babes designed a sincere milk of the word of God that we may grow thereby. That's, this, so this, is not to, this was to them, but Israel did not believe. Now it is to us. But this speaks of the spirit of judgment that, that is in the church. Let's keep reading here, verse, uh, verses number 6. And for a spirit of judgment to him that sit in judgment. There's one that sits in judgment in every church. Namely who? The New Testament pastor. But the Lord is a diadem of beauty and a spirit of judgment. Now, where is that spirit of judgment at? It is in the church primarily in the church court. Can the church say amen? amen? Read. And for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Now, remember, the pastor doesn't do it by himself, so he has some that help, right? They're called deacons or elders in your Bible. Can the church say amen? amen. So what are we doing when we, when we have a, a judgment that must be issued? We're turning, Brother Follett, the battle to the gate. Gates in your Bible refer to judgment. This is what you do whenever the, the deacon board convenes and has to deal with the matter in any church. We're turning the battle to the gate. Or we're judging the battle, we're judging the case, excuse me, turning the battle to the gate and dealing with the issue. And who is in the midst of us? Jesus is as a spirit of judgment. Praise the Lord. And whatever bishop the church issues, 
Whatever we issue as a, as a court, God honors the judgment. Can the church say hallelujah? For whatever is bound on earth, and we're going to read that scripture in a few minutes, is bound in heaven. Are you with me? So this is how God does it in the church. Are you with me tonight? Yeah. All right. Now let's go to Matthew chapter number um, 20, uh, Matthew chapter 18. Can the church say hallelujah? hallelujah. All right. And we're interested in verses numbers, um, starting with verses 14. I think that's, that'll be sufficient. And then we, we, we dealt with this particular chapter before, but this is our New Testament example of the procedure, excuse me, and how we deal with things in the church. Praise the Lord. See, the church is like a, if I can use this terminology, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. The church would be likened to a field. And a field has to, at time, have maintenance. Are you with me? So whenever there's maintenance to be, uh, to be taking place, sometimes you have to cut things out. You have to pull the weeds out. You have to cut the grass down and all of those type of things, correct? Hallelujah. Because the Bible calls the church his husbandry. That's what the church is. Or God's cultivated field. But he has a husbandman that helps to do the job in weeding and gardening and all of those type of things. So sometimes in the church court, we have to do some pruning, some weeding, some gardening. Can the church say hallelujah? Because if, if you let things get overran, then eventually the church will become, the things uh, within the church will become choked out. Anybody ever drove past somebody's house? that they haven't mowed their lawn in a whole year? Most of what you're seeing is not grass. It's weeds. Praise the Lord. Am I right? Because, listen to me closely here, weeds grow faster than any other plant. And they take absolutely no, how can I say, they take absolutely no uh, um, I'm trying to, maintenance. You don't have to do anything to get them. But you have to do something to keep them out. Thank you for that. Praise the Lord. I'm trying to give you an analogy. So sometimes this is what God does to help the church run the right way. Can the church say amen? The pastor has to be equipped with the mind and the skill set to deal with the specific needs of the church. If he doesn't, he cannot function properly. He can ignore things that need to be dealt with. If he ignores them, then the, as we read, I think it was a couple Bible classes ago, he would be referred to as, in the 25th chapter of Matthew, as 24th chapter, excuse me, as a wicked servant. And when the Lord comes... To check up on him, he's going to cut him asunder. Why? Because he neglects the duty and the charge to make sure that the church is running the proper way. Can the church say amen? I'll give you this example also. The church, the pastor has to be a counselor. He has to be able to counsel the people. He can't say, well, you know, I'm not equipped, so I'm going to send you to some, some counselor out in the world. If you don't know how to do it, go get some education so you can do it. Praise the Lord. Because at the end of the day, if they tell them something wrong and you send them there and they fall off a cliff, this is for the tape, then you're responsible for it. Because you sent, you sent a child of God to a place to get counsel from somebody that is unjust. I can show you that in the Bible too. 18th chapter of the book of Matthew. I mean, not Matthew, the 18th chapter of the book of Luke. Praise the Lord. What did the, what did the woman do? She came to the unjust judge that, re, that feared no man and regarded not God. Can the church say amen? And so Jesus directed her back to faith in him. When the Lord cometh, will he find faith in the earth? Well, where's faith at? It's in the church. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I heard of a pastor that was having an issue within his church, and he told the, the individual, he said, well, I, I'm not equipped to deal with that. 
so I'm not going to deal with it. Well, what do you mean? You're not equipped to deal with it. You better get equipped to deal with it. You got the job now, so you better get some advice. And I tell, I tell, I tell uh, pastors this also. Not, now, this is, more, this is more geared for pastors, but you're getting it tonight. I tell young pastors, when they're coming in, I said, don't try to do this by yourself. If you don't know, you better get the right answer. You better surround yourself with experienced men. Praise the Lord. Because there's going to be some things that you will encounter that you don't know about. And you better get somebody that you know that is spiritual, that has a track record, that's been through the ranks, or you're going to mess somebody up. And if you mess them up, then you're going to have to deal with it. Praise the Lord. I tell young pastors that sometimes, that's, now you need to do this. Don't try to be, I'm the pastor, I know everything, so I don't need to listen to nobody. You do that if you want to. And one of these days, you're going to say something, and you're going to regret that you said that. Can the church say amen? Hallelujah. Why did I say that? I don't know, but I think it needed to be said. So let's go now here to the 18th chapter of Matthew. Now, verses numbers 11 through uh, approximately 14 deal, saints, with the parable of the lost sheep. Now, that parable, saints, deals with the extent, saints, that God goes to save one soul. The extent that he goes to. God goes to the greatest extent to save one soul. And then it transitions us, of course, into what he's going to say and dealing with the church court, because this is what we're doing. Whenever, Sister Richardson, we're dealing with issues within the church and someone needs to be reconciled back to God, we're trying to save one soul. And hide, as James said in one place, a multitude of sins. Because if a person will not accept that which the church court gives them, a multitude of sins will follow them. That has to do with what will come after they reject God. Because that's exactly what will happen. I watched it. When people say, well, I don't want to do that. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't believe that I need to do that. And the next thing you know, the devil comes and he begins to destroy them. And the scriptures are fulfilled. You see, the one thing that we have to understand, Bishop, is that the word of God is always right. And so sometimes people think that the pastor is some prophet. He just, he just has some... He has some, some, some uh, uh, some strange connection. He can just figure things out. All we do is say what the scripture said. And God backs up the word. Now there are times when God does give us some enlightenment. But for the most part, we're just saying exactly what the Bible said and the track record of the scriptures always proves itself out. Cast your bread upon the water and not many days it will come. That's not karma. That's just whatever you put out, it comes back. You, we reap what we sow. That's the Bible. Can the church say amen? So if, if, if the scripture says one thing and I do contrary, whatever I put out is coming back. Can the church say hallelujah? I can't change that. That is for the, that is for the world and also for those that are part of the church. It works both ways. Can the church say hallelujah? And it cannot be altered, Bishop. Hallelujah. No man can, get it, can change it. No man can alter it. So verses numbers 11, I'm going to repeat myself. Do 14, deal with how God goes to every measure to save one individual. Because it's not his will that any should perish. It's not his desire. God, Bishop, does not want anybody to be lost. The scripture says in one place he has no pleasure in the death of the fool. Can the church say amen? So let's pick it up with verses numbers, um, let me see here, 14. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. This is the reason why he does, this is the reason why it's not his will. Let's read verses numbers of 15. Read. Moreover, if thy brother shall, excuse me, trespass against thee, go and tell him thy fault between him and thee alone. Now stop right there. So the first thing, 
there is a trespass that takes place. Now, this has to do, if you mark making notes in your Bible, has to do with going beyond boundaries. I'm going to give you an example of what going beyond boundaries. If I was to walk up to Bishop and snatch his tie off his, off his, off his, uh, off his neck, spin him around on the, on the top of his head, and then come and sit back, I wouldn't be on the boundary, didn't I? What did I do? I physically violated him. Isn't that right? So what am I supposed to do? Yes, I'm supposed to repent, exactly. But I have to reconcile with him. I have to acknowledge that I broke a boundary with him. Another boundary would be if I had a brother and I was speaking evil of him, speaking about him, running him down, saying he's anything but a child of God. That's a boundary in your Bible. Can the church say amen? Walking, walking past somebody and not saying praise the Lord is not a boundary. That's a feeling that was hurt. That's not a boundary. Praise the Lord. But if I'm doing things to cause harm to any to somebody, I wouldn't be on boundaries. All right? So he says here, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him. So at this point, it's two individuals. It's the trespasser, praise the Lord, and the one that's been trespassed against. And this is between the, them two. So if I do something that maybe was hurtful to somebody, I need to go to them and tell him, the person that has been trespassed against, go and says, well, you know, this thus and thus and thus happened. Now what happens after that? Read, and if he shall hear thee, then thou shalt what? Gain thy brother. If a trespass has been committed, a boundary that has been broken, and the person that has been trespassed against, or the person that's trespassed, excuse me, praise the Lord, receives the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the words of the person that's been trespassed against, then what do you do? You gain your brother. Or you, the term here, gain, means you help save him. See, the first way that issues are resolved between individuals in the church, they're resolved between them alone. They talk it out. And if I have the Holy Spirit and tomorrow I have the Holy Ghost and we're both saved, then there's nothing that we, can, we cannot work through. That's the first way you deal with it. We don't get on the phone. I say, well, you know, well, um, you know what my wife did to me? Hallelujah. You know what she did to me, sister? So he, so she's supposed to be saved. No, I don't do that. Why? Because that's not what the scripture said. I go to, them, to, to, to the person that broke or went beyond the boundary of me. Or if I took something that was hers, Praise the Lord. She comes to me and says, well, Dorian, that's mine. Hallelujah. And if I give it back to her, then we've, we've mended the fence. Are you with me? Now, in that case, you still need to go get some prayer. But if there's a case where feelings were, were broken, that's something a little bit different. But the point is simply here, that now it's between the two individuals. And if the person that did wrong hears what they did, you've helped save them. So there's only two individuals here at, in this case. Now you're going to see how we proceed here. Let's keep reading here. Verses numbers of 16. Read. But if he sh shall not hear thee, that is the, the trespasser, will not hear the person that has been trespassed against, read. Then take with thee one or two witnesses. Well, two more, excuse me. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, uh, of, uh, two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Now, I'm going to show you a scripture that in the Old Testament, nobody was found guilty unless they were two or three witnesses. If there was nobody that was there, there at least had to be two or three witnesses before a conviction could take place. So let's keep reading here, all right? And if he neglect to hear them, these were individuals that you took with him to try to get the matter resolved. Now, I, me personally, I would deal with this in terms of there, there's issues between, between saints. You go get a deacon, somebody that's spiritual, that can hear the matter, praise the Lord, that can help resolve the matter and try to get down to the bottom of it. Now, if they won't hear the witness, if they won't hear them, they won't hear, the per, the, uh, hear you, let's see what happens, and if you neglect to hear them, then tell it to what? The church. What is the church? The pastor and the ruling board of elders. 
Can the church say amen? See how you're moving up the chain? You're going between two individuals that have an issue, getting a witness, namely somebody that is spiritual, and I would like it to be somebody who, uh, a deacon of some sort. And if that, if that, if that it won't get resolved there, let's go up the chain and let's deal with it in the church court. Are you with me? This is now, now I want to show you something. This is in your Bible. So this is the way it's supposed to be done. This is what our fathers taught us. This is in the scripture. Hallelujah. And it cannot be altered. Are you with me? Read. Then he says, let's keep reading here. Tell and uh, neglect to hear them. Read. Tell it uh, unto the church. Now let's keep going here. But if he neglect to hear the church, that is the, tra- the, the trespasser, neglects to hear you, a witness, two or three witnesses, or what have you, and then the church. Let's keep reading. Let him be what? As a heathen man and a publican. What is a heathen man? Unsaved. So they won't listen to anybody. They won't listen to you telling them, well, please give me back my, give me back my television set. You stole it from me. They won't hear that. Then they won't hear somebody who is spiritual, praise the Lord, who comes in to try to alleviate the matter and tell you, well, now, my brother, please get a brother back his television set. You're supposed to have the Holy Ghost. Give him back what's his. You won't hear them. Then the pastor say, please return the television set. Please do it. They won't hear that. Then what are you supposed to do? Count them as what? He's a man and what? A publican. Now, you don't count them as a enemy. I'm going to show you that scripture right now. Let's go now to um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 um, and verse 15. Because in the church court, the object is to bring somebody to a place of reconciliation. See, we're not trying to kill people. We're trying to help them. So you don't count the individual, the the person who is acting like a sinner, as an enemy. You count them as a brother. You admonish them. You try to help them. But if they won't listen, then you have to just let them go on their way. And then we have to have a judgment issue. Let's go now to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, verse 15. I want to show you this. Are you with me tonight? Praise the Lord. I'm going to try to move a little quicker here. Because if somebody said, well, this happened, I'm going to ask you, well, did you talk to him? Well, no, I didn't talk to him. Well, go talk to him then. And then, then, then we move up the chain. Are you with me? Because God wants the church to run like what? A well oil machine. He wants, to, he wants the church to be a threefold cord that cannot easily be broken. Are you with me? Now, you won't hear this type of teaching everywhere. Because some people teach, well, you just go on your side of the church, and you go on your side of the church, and then when church go out, y'all both go out different doors. That's not what the Bible teaches. Because here's the point. Let me get, I'll use my, my wife as an example. We, me, me and Tamar have an issue. Now, we don't have any problems. We love each other. And, and, and then I go to the bishop of the diocese. He said, me and my wife are having a problem. And he says, well, you go, you go to your bedroom, and you go to your bedroom, and y'all don't only talk when y'all need to uh, pay the bills. What kind of foolishness is that? If you can't get together down here, how are you going to get together in heaven? Praise the Lord. If I, can't, if I can't get along with people that have the Holy Ghost down here, how am I going to get along with Jesus who is the Holy Ghost in heaven? Follow me now. This is your Bible. Can the church say amen? I have to what? Reconcile. Can the church say amen? I have to reconcile. If I'm going to make it, I have to reconcile. Praise the Lord. All right? Let's read here. Now, this is what you do to the, to the, to the uh, individual that is operating as a what? Heathen man. This is their behavior. They're operating as chaffed. They have the Holy Spirit, but they're not walking in the Spirit now because they have neglected to hear what? The church. Are you with me? Let's read here. Verse 14. Let's start with verse 14. If any man man obey not the words of this epistle. So Paul is saying whatever we said in this epistle to the church at Thessalonica and the saints at Thessalonica, Sister Julian, 
if a man does not walk according to the rule of the church, because here's the thing, the church trumps everybody. The church trumps the pastor. I'm a part of the church, but the, God's church trumps everybody. Nobody is above the whole. Everybody has a job to do to make up the church, but nobody is above the whole. See, the sum of the parts is not greater than the whole. You ever heard that term? The parts make up the whole, but the whole is what God is after. So what he's saying to the elders of Thessalonica, the church at large, praise the Lord, namely to the ministry, if a person does not hear or uh, receive the words of this book, because this book that I wrote to you, these words are the words of God. And they are given to govern the conduct of the children of God. And it cannot be altered. But he said, if they don't listen, let's keep reading here. He said, if any man obey not the words of this, of this epistle, note that man. Take note of him. Praise the Lord. What, what is he saying? Watch him. Look at him. Can the church say amen? Now, I can show you, I can tell you some things they used to do in the old church. We don't do that anymore. They weren't playing back then. If you were wrong back then, you really was, praise the Lord. But mercy's rejoicing over judgment. Can the church say hallelujah? It's a little different now. In those days, there was a little lack of wisdom in terms of knowing how to deal with these matters in a more judicial way. Not to kill an individual, but to bring a person to a place of being saved. Because our job is not to kill people. Can the church say amen? It was said years ago that, um, that when Bishop, I think it was Bishop Hancock used to preach, every other word was to, I don't want to say the word because I don't want anybody to think I'm, I'm, I'm swearing, but to H-E-L-L, you go. He used to preach that hard because he was to preach hellfire and brimstone. Now, th now, you can look it up. This is what they say. I'm not making none of this stuff up. He was so serious about living right, of course, early on in his early ministry, that he, they, they used to tell me if you went to some of his Bible classes, you would walk out of there and one of you was saved or not. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And, and I'm talking about people who was really saved. You would wonder if you was actually, actually were walking with God. He taught that strong. You know what I'm talking about, Brother Father. This is all history. Praise the Lord. I got the tapes to prove it. But this is the way it was. But, our, but, but here's the point. Our job, saints, is not to kill people. I'm not here for, to, for people to be lost. I'm here to help people be saved. So sometimes you do have to have some tenderness. You do have to have a little bit of mercy if a person is showing remorse, praise the Lord, to try to help them. And you don't put more on them than they can bear. Because sometimes the judgment can be so harsh that they won't be able to, to bear up under it. Now, if a person just don't want to listen, then you put it on them and say, you need to go somewhere. Find you somewhere else to go before you kill somebody. And in most cases, I'll tell you this. When people don't want to listen, they won't stay around anyway. They'll just go. Because as I tell, I tell you all the time, the devil will not sit there and let you tell on him. He'll run. Get the church amen. Nobody is going to stand around and be stepped on. Get the church, and that's what the word of God will do. It will step on me if I'm wrong. What is God trying to do? He's trying to, bring the, he's trying to perfect his, son, his children. So if there's something wrong and things are being said, it's going, to get under, it's going to get under their skin. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And the scripture will be fulfilled where the time will come when they will not endure what? Sound doctrine. Nobody can tell me that they've never said in the Bible class and heard something that told, that told you exactly what you needed to do. Praise the Lord. If you walk with God for any period of time, the word of God will find everybody. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. Because nobody has arrived yet. I'm living saved. I'm holy. I'm walking with God. But the word of God, saints, finds everybody. Can the church say amen? Okay, let's keep reading here. So he says what? Note that, note that man. Read. And what? Have no company with him. So some have asked, well, if I have a, a backslide in my family that is not saved, um, that walked away from God, am I supposed to have any, any uh, contact with him? That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that you have to be careful with your fellowship. 
Because you do not want to make the individual that is against the church feel comfortable where they're at. So what I'm saying is that our best friends should not be backsliders. I should be going out with everybody that is not saved. See, we got enough problem dealing with people that, how can I say it? We, I want to... No, I, no I, want, I want you to understand. I wasn't going to say it like that. But we have enough problems with dealing with the world. Okay? All right? Now you want to deal with people that are supposed to be saved and make them feel comfortable. That's what he's saying. If a person has violated the will of God, has went against the church, openly has an issue with the house of God, with the people of God, why do I want to make them feel comfortable where they're at? That's what Paul is saying. Praise the Lord. He's not necessarily saying if, if, you, can, if you have a, a child that's not walking with God, you can't have any fellowship with him. That's not what he's saying because some have thought that. Well, you know, because we used to teach like that. You know, no, you can't come over to the house. You can't do all of these things. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying you cannot basically make them feel comfortable. Praise the Lord. Do not make everybody that's not saved your bosom buddy. I tell people like this, if, your, if all your friends are unsaved, you need, to look at, you need to look at how close you walk with God. Praise the Lord. If, if, if I got the Holy Ghost, I shouldn't like being around everybody that don't have it. <laughs> Can the church say amen? Birds of a feather flock together. Can the church say amen? You're known by the company that you keep. If you don't want to be known as a bank robber, don't hang out with, with people who steal stuff. Can the church say amen? Because nobody can tell me that if I hang out with people that's not saved, that some of what they do won't rub off on me. Young people, listen to me. Your best friend should be saved, people. When I got saved, God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I lost all of my unsaved friends. Do you, you listen to me, what I'm telling you? Them guys I used to run with, they didn't want to hear nothing about no Jesus. They didn't want to hear nothing about no Holy Ghost. They didn't want to hear nothing about that. Praise the Lord. Am I right, Deacon? You, some, them, they, didn't, they in the view room mirror. If they didn't want to follow Jesus, I had to leave them. Praise the Lord. I don't know why people are so concerned about trying to pull people up that don't want to be pulled up. If they don't want to come up, then you have to leave them where they're at. So what he's saying is that this would be an individual that has rejected the church openly. He said, have no company with them. Do not be fellowshipping with people that are rejected the will of God, rejected the church. All right, let's keep reading here. That he may what? Be ashamed. Now, why, are, why is this taking place? Because the, it, we want the individual to be ashamed of what they did. Let me give you an example. Third chapter, uh, not third chapter, but I think it would be the fifth chapter, if memory serves me correct, of 1 Corinthians, when the young man was in fornication with his, fa with his, with his uh, father's wife or his stepmother. Paul judged the case being present with them in spirit, absent in body. And he said, you should have judged the matter and put the young man out to, for the destruction of his flesh that his soul would be saved. But they weren't doing that, says the Christian. They were, they were talking about him. Read your history. They were talking about him, and they were not dealing with the case at hand. They were letting the young man stay around. And he was in an open, um, incestuous relationship with his father's wife. And nobody did said anything about it. So what did, what did, uh, what did Paul say? Put him out. This fits in with the scripture. Why? Because Paul wanted Deacon the boy to be ashamed of what he was doing. Not to kill him. He says that his, that his body would be delivered as it were to Satan, that the soul would be saved. Because I'm going to tell you what happened. When we tell them, no, you can't do that, you have to go somewhere else, you know what happened? When the, de the devil will whoop them. Because remember this, they're still a child of God. They're still, when I, when I, when I say they're a child of God, they are a disobedient child but they still have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They're out. They're backslidden. They're full with their own way. But what does God do? He takes the world, he takes the Satan and the demons to whoop them. How, now, how does that happen? They lose their jobs. Their cars break down. All kind of things happen. 
I'm telling you, this is what happens to people. When people walk away from God, everything falls apart. I've seen it over and over and over again. Praise the Lord. They say, I don't want to be saved. I want to go out and party with everybody else. And we try to do everything we can and say, well, no, you don't want to do that. I'm going to marry him. I'm going to do what I want to do. And next thing you know, the enemy comes in and destroys their life. And sometimes we, 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 we look around like, how did that happen? The Bible tells us how it happened. Praise the Lord. When you reject the counsel of God. Now, I'm not talking necessarily to us. I'm just talking in general. This is what God does because the scriptures have to be fulfilled. So the point in not having company with him, the point in marking the individual is not to pull a bullseye on his back as an enemy, but so that the individual will be ashamed of what they did. Now, verses number 15 is going to let you know that. And what do you say here? What do you say here? Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him what? As a brother. Here's what we do. We don't look at them as an enemy. We hate what they did, but we love the person. Because at the end of the day, we want them to come back and receive the judgment of the church. Can the church say amen? We don't want them to never feel like they could ever get back because of what they may think, they, how they're going to be received. And I can show you that also in your Bible. With the parable of the what? Prodigal son. When the prodigal son came back, what was the father doing? He was waiting for him. Brought the boy back. This is a parable. Now, this is here to make a point. He brought him back. He gave him back his position. And then his elder son, which will be representative to a certain degree of the saints that may look at the individual that's coming back and wondering why are they being received with such joy? Because, as we said in the 17th, uh, 18th chapter of Matthew, it's not his will that what? One sheep would be lost. Can the church say amen? God wants everybody to be saved, saints. So how dare me if somebody has been walked away from God, God shows them mercy, and they come back in the church, and I say, well, I'm not going to pray for you because I know what you did. I'm going to receive them back into the fold if they offer the fruits of repentance and have a contrite heart and deal with the judgment. Now, I'll tell you this. When a person leaves the church under judgment, and they come back. If the judgment is not lifted, they have to still deal with the judgment when they get back. It doesn't matter how long they've been gone. When you come back, you got to still deal with it. If the court chooses to show mercy, deacon, and lift the judgment, then, that's the, then that is the right of the court. But if the court still says you still have to deal with what happened before you left, sometimes it may be an apology, sometimes it may be a set down, it may be many different things. You still have to deal with it. Can the church say hallelujah? Why? Because the soul needs to be saved. And number two, we have to, sometimes we have to give an example. Let me give you an example in your Bible. I think it was an example in the Old Testament where one was caught in adultery. And they were stoned, if memory serves me co co correctly, um, publicly. That served two purposes. Number one, it shows us in that day that Sister Amy, judgment was rejoicing over mercy. Number two, it served as, as an example to anybody that does such a thing, this could be the end result. Let me give you another example why these things are coming to my mind. Do you remember what happened with Achan? Now, some said, was, was Achan saved? I believe he was saved. Somebody said, well, no, he couldn't have been. He made his confession. Praise the Lord. He was honest. But he still had to pay the piper. Because his whole house, everything he owned, everything that he stole was thrown out. Praise the Lord. That he stole, and then he was stoned. He made his confession to, uh, to the man of God, but the judgment still had to be issued. Praise the Lord. That's just my, I don't, I don't have any scripture to, to say that, but I believe in as much as he went through the procedure and he dealt with the, the, with the judgment that he had to be put to death, praise the Lord, then God may show mercy. But the point is simply this. That's another example. It, show, it showed two things. Number one, that you don't want to do that because this may be the end. Number two, 
that in that day, the judgment of God rejoiced over mercy. But today we live in the land of mercy. See, God is not taking, telling the saints to take up stones when somebody falls into sin. Praise the Lord. He's just saying, accept the judgment. Can the church say amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what do I have to do? Sometimes I may have to humble myself and say, well, you know, it wasn't nobody else. It was me. So I have to deal with it. So let's now, let's go back to Matthew chapter number 18. We're almost done with this tonight. Can the church say amen? Now, what you're, t- what you're hearing today, saints, many people who have been saved for many years don't have this understanding. This is a Bible class that is more geared for ministers to show them how to govern in their churches properly. Can the church say amen? All right, let's go back to the 18th chapter. Let's finish reading this here. Let's go now. Uh, let's drop down to verse 18. Praise the Lord. Verse 18, chapter 18. Are you with me? Matthew chapter 18 and 18. All right, let's read. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now where is that at? In the church court. Now Jesus said this in another place when he spoke to Peter in the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew. That had to do with anybody that rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, Peter had the right to bind them. Anybody that received it, they were loosed. This is dealing in the 18th chapter with the church court. And in the church court, our judgments are binding and they are loosing. And they are irreversible. Can the church say amen? And I'll tell you this, because I've heard of this. Sometimes say, well, you know, I went to this church and I got a, I got a judgment as to what the pastor and the, and the elders um, of the church said that we needed to do in this matter. And it was a matter of life and death of the soul. Well, I didn't like that, so now I'm going to go over across town and get another judgment. It don't work like that. Just like in civil government or in, um, in federal government, one court that's on the same equal playing field can't trump another court. If one judge, if one federal judge says this is what you have to do, you can't go to another federal judge. And then that judge say, well, you know, I don't care what he said because don't worry about that. I got another judgment. Everybody has to abide by the same law. Now, if the law can figure that out, how much more the church? See, the problem is the pastor's. The pastors ask no questions. You know why? Because all they're trying to do is get their numbers up. I'm talking real tonight. This is what's happening today. There there is no pastoral courtesy. There's no pastoral, uh, 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 how can I say, um, camaraderie. We're not competing with one another. We're on the same team. We're supposed to be anyway. And I'm going to tell you what happens. When you receive somebody in your church that's under church, that's under church uh, judgment from somewhere else, the devil is going to tear things up. Follow what I'm telling you tonight. Now, I, I know this is not us, but this is what happens, saints. When people do these things, the enemy shows up and those people cause all kind of problems. Because if they were rebellious one place, They're going to be rebellious somewhere else. Because the Bible said, listen to me closely, the spirit of rebellion is as the sin of what? Witchcraft. Brother, all your hair is going to fall out. They're going to cause you all kind of headaches. Bishop Combs said that he paid somebody to leave his church. (laughs) He was sitting at me he said, I told the brother, listen, I'm going to give you some money and don't come back. I'm, just leave, please. He was causing so many problems. This is what he said in the meeting. I'm just telling you what he said. You can, you can ask him when he get here. He said it publicly. This is what Bishop Cohn said. Now, I'm not going to pay nobody to leave. I'm just going to put him out. I'm going to keep my money. Praise the Lord. But this is what he did. He, the person was causing so many problems. He said, I, I, we, 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 we've had too many meetings with you. We've done all these things, and you just want to do what you want to do. You cannot spread that filth in the congregation. Here's some money. Do not come back, please. 
This is what he said. Sometimes you have to just let, well, all the time, you just have to let the devil go. Don't keep the devil in the church. You know why? Because, brothers and sisters, saints, the devil never is going to get saved. Are you with me? Now, we have saints here. But we have to understand, sometimes, deacon, the devil does come to church. And he puts a suit on, a hat, a tie. It goes up to the sisters and says, praise the Lord. How are you doing today? Can the church say amen? And the pastor recognizes he's the devil. And the pastor tells you, he's the devil, sister. You better leave him alone. If you don't leave him alone, then the devil's going to get you. <laughs> Can the church say amen? Then sometimes the devil comes in a nice, nice, and she just looks so nice, and she's very dressed nice, and she smells so good. And she walks right by you. And she, and the bishop, you say floozy, and then bats her eye. You sisters know what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. When she grabs your hand, she holds on a little bit tighter. Brother, instead of just saying praise the Lord, she kind of just grabs it and then rubs it a little bit. Somebody said, that's the devil. <laughs> or that, that is a demon. I, I'll say it like that. Somebody said, no, it's not. Yes, it is. <laughs> here, here, listen to what I'm telling you. And what do you need to do? Listen to the pastor when he tells you, like, now that sister, listen, you need to stay away from her. You know, you know don't, don't do that. You know, don't go there. Because, you know, she needs to get the Holy Ghost. Well, she says she has the Holy Ghost. A lot of people say they got things. I can say I got a million dollars, and I don't have it. And that would be a lie. Now, I'm not lying tonight. I don't have a million dollars, but I'm just simply making a point. This is because this is doing somebody says they got something. That don't mean they have it. Because there's more signs to somebody having the Holy Ghost than this speaking in tongues. Now, somebody say, well, pastor, prove it. Let me give it to you like this. The old people used to say this. You have to wait and see how they live. Because there is a pseudo spirit. A sort of kind of light. A knockoff. It's not a Louis Vuitton, it's a Louis Vuitton. It's not a Gucci, it's a Mucci or something. Some, it ain't real. And sometimes we get fooled by it. So what did the pastor do? We said, let's wait a while. Let's, let's just wait and see how things go. Let's watch. Hallelujah. And the one thing about the Holy Ghost, I got to let you go here because I, <laughs> I guess I get through this tonight. The Holy Spirit changes people. <laughs> Nobody gets the Holy Ghost and no changes take place. I don't care if you just got the Holy Ghost yesterday Praise the Lord. There is some type of change that takes place. I mean, when I got the Holy Ghost and God dealt with me, he said, go out to your car and take all of that filthy, ungodly music that you have in your car and throw it away. I was sitting there frying chicken, and I was just sitting there in my own, just doing my thing, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost told me, go do it. And I turned like a robot. Walked out to my little Great escort, this was years and years ago, before I became the Grand Rapids. Years and years ago, took all of that Rick James and all of that, all of that Osley brothers, all that foolishness, and threw it away. See, I, was, I, I used to listen to that, that stuff. I was young. So I, I, praise the Lord. I needed Jesus, but I got him now. But the point I'm simply saying, the Holy Ghost makes a change. You're not going to be saved listening to the filth of the world. The scripture came to my mind when I was in the pulpit. I will put no wicked thing before my eyes. You put a wicked thing in front of you, then the wicked thing becomes the person that, uh, that is looking at. Can the church say hallelujah? Anybody have any questions tonight? This subject, any other subject? Yes, Brother Bobby.